Amen. Uh, thanks to the Fintons for uh, that beautiful trumpet prelude. They were singing, they were playing the song, Rejoice the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Isn't that an amazing call for what we're about to do today? All right, so let's stand. We're going to, our call to worship is from Psalm 24, 7 through 10, and we're remembering Christ entering the temple, that triumphal entry um, that happened on Palm Sunday. And so we're going to lift up, we're going to lift up our King, Lord Jesus. I'm going to have you guys read the text in yellow. Again, this is Psalm 24. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. Amen. Sing with us. Praise God.
lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are our Lord, King of glory, we shout hosannas to praise you. With eager hands, we place our cloaks and palms on the path before you. Yet, Lord, we confess that the mouths that seek to praise you often deny or defy you. And we confess that the hands that seek to serve you often become fists. Lord, hear us as we confess.
beautiful, he's mighty, he's awesome, he's wonderful, and he's a million and one other things and more. In fact, that's part of what's going to keep us busy for forever and ever in heaven, because that's how long it's going to take us to, to fully, properly declare uh, how, how wonderful and amazing he is. And we have the opportunity to uh, get a taste uh, here today of what we'll be doing uh, forever in heaven as we lift up his great name, and we're thankful that you're here with us, whether you've joined us here in person, whether you're joining us online, we welcome you here to Village Church of Gurney. My name is Brandon Smith. I'm one of the pastors here. And we realize that, especially with uh, this being uh, Easter week, that uh, we may have some people that are joining us for the first time, or maybe you've just started coming in recent weeks. And we're especially thankful that, that you're here with us. And if there's ever anything we can do to answer questions you might have about Village Church, if there are ways that we can, uh, can minister to you personally, uh, just just let us know. We, we are here to serve. Um, for those of you who are here in person, you can stop by Guest Central out in the lobby uh, after the services. For those of you joining us online, uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can contact us uh, through the church's website, uh, through email address, even through social media. And uh, just, just let us know how we can uh, get to know you and how we can come alongside of you. That's, that's why we're here. We just want to help you experience uh, everything that God has uh, in store for your lives. Uh, we are thankful for the continued uh, faithful giving of the people of Village Church to the work of the Lord. And uh, please know that as the weeks and months have been going by here during this, uh, this still unique, still unusual year, God is continuing to do uh, great things in people's lives. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, continue investing in that work uh, through Village Church, you can do so online. You see the information on the slide uh, here behind me. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, we do have the giving boxes out in the lobby. You can also uh, place your offering there uh, later on this morning. Uh, this is Easter week, and a few things that we just want to uh, not only remind you of, but uh, bring you up to date on regarding our services Again, Good Friday services, 4, 5.30, and 7 p.m. Uh, we would ask that you sign up ahead of time online uh, just so we know who is coming and uh, that we don't uh, uh, overfill one of the, uh, the services. Uh, got some special things in store for that that I believe will, uh, God will use to draw our attention uh, to the cross of Jesus and uh, helping us to remember the, uh, the great love uh, that he had for us, but also uh, to reflect upon our sin that uh, placed him on the cross. Uh, but then on Easter Sunday, we'll gather and uh, celebrate the fact that uh, the death could not hold Jesus down. Uh, we've got a number of opportunities to uh, gather for that. Uh, 7.30 uh, is going to be outdoors. That's our sunrise service. Uh, that will be held here on site at Village Church. And we do ask that you sign up for that ahead of time, even though there is no attendance cap uh, for that service. Now, our 9 o'clock and 1045 services uh, that will be held here in the auditorium, uh, those are full. I was just uh, informed uh, in between services that the 9 o'clock service is now full. The 1045 service filled up during the week. And uh, as you come, uh, for those of you signed up or ahead of time, we would ask maybe consider coming just a few minutes early on Sunday uh, next week because we will have people uh, in here who will help direct you to a, a pot of seats that matches the size of group that you have with you as we want to maximize uh, as much of the space in here as we can uh, so that as many people as possible can, uh, can enjoy these services uh, in person. Our 1215 service, uh, there are still slots available for that. If you want to worship in person, uh, you can sign up for the 1215 services. We will be live streaming the 9 o'clock and 1045 services, and then we will have those available online, uh, whether through the church's website or our uh, YouTube channel, uh, if you want to even watch one of those services uh, later on in the week. Now, with this uh, focus coming up on these services, we want to also remind you of what we are doing as a church to prepare for uh, Good Friday and Easter, and we are calling the people of Village Church to a week of prayer, focused prayer, and many of you, we, we would challenge you, encourage you to consider incorporating fasting 
in some way, shape, or form into your time of prayer as well. We want to be asking that God would not only prepare our hearts uh, as uh, worshipers for what he wants to do in us uh, through Good Friday and Easter, but we also want to pray that God would be uh, working in us to prepare us for what he wants to do through us and how he wants to be working through the ministries of Village Church, uh, not just here during uh, Easter time, but beyond as well. We've got uh, a gold mine of resources available on our website, uh, scripture readings and prayer prompts and other things that will help uh, focus and direct your time in prayer. We encourage you to go onto our website, vcgurney.org, check out those resources. And uh, if you have questions about how to use them, how to, how to navigate the website, again, let us know in the church office. We're here to help. But we call all the people of Village Church to participate in some way with this special emphasis here during uh, this Easter week. Uh, finally, uh, for those of you who have uh, younger kids, uh, newborns, to uh, toddlers, infants, uh, this is something we haven't had the opportunity to do here in recent uh, times, but uh, we're looking forward to a time where we can uh, commit parents and kids to the Lord, dedicate them uh, to the Lord in prayer. We've got a special uh, segment planned for our worship services on Mother's Day, May 9th for that. Uh, there is an orientation class that is planned for uh, for mid-April, um, and, and by calling it a class, it, it's very informal. Just a conversation just explains what so we believe at Village Church, that parent-child dedication, what it, what it does signify, and, and also what it doesn't signify. Um, but that just gives us an opportunity to hear the story about how God is even just working your, your, your marriage, your family. Um, and, and for those of you, even if you're, you're a single parent and you want to take this step, you are more than welcome to participate in this as well. Um, we just want to get it, it, It's a privilege that we have as a church uh, to come alongside of families to participate in this, and uh, we want to walk you through that process whatever ways we can. So you can sign up online, sign up through the church website, um, contact us in the office if you need help with any of that. Well, at this point in our worship service, uh, we are going to be ministered to uh, by a song that our Village Church Choir uh, has prepared for us. This is pre-recorded, um, but in preparation for uh, being ministered to in song by our choir, I want to read to you from Revelation 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Amen.
Amen. All praises be to our King. He is wonderful. Let me pray before we look at God's Word today. <clears throat> Father, our hearts echo what our choir has just led us in. Lord, that as you, our King, have come to us, may we respond in worship and praise and adoration. Hosanna in the highest. All glory and praise to our omnipotent and powerful and mighty and good and compassionate and gracious King. We praise you, Lord. As we look at your word now, as we reflect and remember that entry years ago, May you find in our hearts and voices a heart that reflects the disciples who welcome you as our Lord and our King. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, meet me in the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Luke uh, chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 28 all the way uh, to verse 40 of Luke chapter 19. Let me read this passage for us, and then we'll take a closer look at it for our time in the Word today. Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 28. God's Word says this. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage at, and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, what, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners had said, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Amen. Amen. Well, in this moment of history, in this cultural moment that Jesus lived in when he walked on this earth, when someone of power or prominence, when a dignitary or a king or a political leader, when someone who was someone came to town or came to a city, there was actually a very specific way that dignitaries would have been welcomed into a city or into a town. Oftentimes, the, the leaders of that city, the political or religious leaders, would meet the dignitary outside of the town. They would go out and meet them. And then they would process in with all the pomp, all the circumstance. All, everyone would have been dressed their best. Uh, this would have been a uh, crowd, uh, full, just kind of traffic jamming, business closed kind of event. And as they come in, they would have processed in with all the attention of a whole city. And then they would process into the city, and then the political or religious leaders would, would kind of oogle over the honor of, of having this dignitary in their presence. They would go on and on with speeches, saying, what, what a privilege, what an honor, what a delight to receive this person of importance in, in our city, in this city. And if it was a king, oftentimes that king would come on a war horse, an expression and to communicate the might and the power. Sometimes they would come with trophies of war and somewhat communicating uh, their, their, their dominance, someone to be feared, someone to, to be intimidated by. And in all of this entry, if that was the expectation, 
we start to see as we look at this passage closer and closer that our king, the king of kings, Christ, his entry was like no other. The way he entered the city was different. The way he was welcomed was not what was expected. His intention was not what was expected. And his welcome, his entry into the city was like no other. Look again. Let's read these opening verses again, verses 28 through 36. Look again at what these say. And when Jesus had said these things, referring back to this parable of the ten minas, and when Jesus said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, so, saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt, tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So they did that. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying it? They said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, uh, they spread their cloaks on the road. Let's pause there. Remember, in this moment that Jesus finds himself in history, his people are under Roman oppression, under the heavy hand of, of Roman leadership and Roman authority, and there was a profound expectation that when the Messiah, when the king, when the king would come, he would finally overthrow their Roman oppressors, that he'd crush them under his feet. And there was this expectation of a king coming in power, a king coming in might, a king coming that would, that would lift from their backs the heavy hand of their Roman oppressors. And we start to see the signals of this as Jesus is entering. When he said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. Now all throughout the Bible, when we hear about Jerusalem, we know that big stuff happens at Jerusalem. There are countless of times over and over and over when big moments of God's redemptive work happens in the city of Jerusalem. So the first readers, or those who are experiencing it for the first time, they know that this city is a big deal. They know that God moves in and through this city, Jerusalem. Then verse 29, it says, when he drew near to Bethpage at Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives. And here's another signal. Here's another indicator of the coming of the Messiah. It was expected that God's glory would, would be revealed at the Mount of Olives. It was the expectation that the Messiah would, would finally come at the Mount of Olives. Another signal that, is this king coming? Is, is he it? Is he here? And then Jesus sends his disciples into the city and saying, go find a colt, go find a donkey. And this was, uh, at this time, the prerogative of a king. Kings would ride colts or donkeys into the city. Some of you, when you first r read this, or as we were reading it through, some of you might have thought, oh, poor owners of the colt, they just got their donkey stolen. <laughs> But understand, Jesus, he's not stealing a donkey. He's not stealing a ride into the city. This, in this time, was a prerogative of a king. Kings would do this. They'd come into the city, and in some ways, it would be a privilege to provide them a transportation in. And this was also, yet again, another signal, because perhaps some there, perhaps the first readers, maybe their mind would have been, went back to the, the prophet Zechariah, who said... Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, here it is, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there's, again, this expectation. When the king comes, he's going to come in on a colt, on a donkey. And here is Jesus. Not only, now catch this, not only is Jesus requesting a donkey, signaling, I am king, but he forecasts it. He, he, he can tell in advance exactly how this finding of the donkey, retrieving of the donkey is going to go. It's one thing to tell the disciples, 
hey, can you go on ahead into the city, find a rental car place, just get whatever's available, and we got to get into this city. It's a whole other thing for Jesus to say, okay, I want you to go ahead into this city and find a cult. Oh, by the way, it's going to be tied up. Oh, oh, by the way, it's going to be a donkey, a colt that no one has ever ridden before. Oh, yeah, and just so I don't leave you out to dry, by the way, when the owners ask, you know, why are you untying, just tell them the Lord has need of it. A lot of oh, by the way, is that after a while you realize it's like you know the future or something. <laughs> and when this happens, it's exactly what happens. They go in, they find this donkey, they untie it. The owners ask, why are you untying it? They say the Lord has need of it, and they bring it to him just as he forecasted, just as he foretold. And we start to see glimpses. We start to get excited with the first readers as they are, as they are seeing, oh my goodness, this is... This is the king. This is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for, the one to triumph, the one to dominate over our enemies, uh, the one who, who knows the future as, as simple and, uh, and, and specific of a donkey tied up in the city. Will he finally fully and completely uh, usher in the fullness of his kingdom right now, right at this moment? Is this he? Is this the one? This is our king. And he's coming. Yet, we look at the rest of this story, we start to realize how a triumphal his entry actually was. Remember, all the expectations culturally in this time, how do you welcome a king into a city? The religious and political leaders meet him outside the city. They usher him in with all the pomp and circumstance. The whole city gets shut down. Here are just his disciples. A multitude of them, yes, but just the disciples welcome him in. He's not ushered into pomp and circumstance. He's not ushered in and welcomed in by speeches of the leaders of the city just oogling over him how, how, how honored they, and how privileged they are to have him come into the city. He's also not coming on a horse a horse would have indicated a king coming for war, a king coming in power, a king coming in dominance. He doesn't come on a horse. He comes humbly on a donkey, certainly still saying, yes, I am a king, but saying I'm a king coming for peace. I'm a king coming in meekness. I'm a king coming in humility. I'm a king coming in frailty. And as he continues into the city, you can almost sense, you can almost, yes, the, the disciples, those who are welcoming him in, but you start to read all the signals and you, wait a second. It's almost underwhelming, almost too ordinary that his welcome doesn't really befit his rank. Remember, he's God. And yet, his welcome is almost a triumphal, and his intention almost seems like a wasted opportunity. A king come humbly in peace. Lord, we need someone to throw off Rome. We need some to, someone to, to destroy our, 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 our earthly enemies. Why are you coming on a donkey? And all of a sudden, we start to see this almost underwhelming, a triumphal entry Yet on the surface level, we think, oh man, what a letdown, what a discouragement. We were, we were waiting for a, a Messiah King, one who would dominate, one who would destroy our enemies. But we see very quickly just how fitting this humble entry truly is. Because as we look at the entire life of Jesus Christ, we realize that he is the King who has given up glory itself to humble himself Jesus' entire life took a trajectory of humility. Can you imagine leaving glory? Can you imagine leaving heaven where angels constantly worship you and coming to ordinary earth where people mock you, where you get tired and have to sleep, where you have to pause and eat. Can you imagine how humbling that was for our Savior? And we start to realize on the surface level, uh, what a missed opportunity. But we start to see just how fitting this entry truly is because his entire trajectory is a trajectory of humility that will ultimately lead to the cross. 
that though we expected a Messiah that would destroy our, our earthly enemies, we have a Messiah who came to destroy the, the ultimate enemies, the enemies underneath our enemies of sin and brokenness and evil and death, and he would do so by absorbing them up into himself. He didn't get the welcome he deserved. It almost seems like he's, it's a, a missed intention or a missed opportunity. But see just how fitting his entry truly is. He's coming humbly and see humble himself. And all the way through the Gospel of Luke when it says that he's going up to Jerusalem, 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 this is the final step, this is the final stop on this journey to Jerusalem. It's in his own death. This is how he has come for us. And we start to see, profoundly so, our king's coming is like no other. He wasn't welcomed like other kings. He wasn't celebrated like other rulers. But his coming was like no other because his intention was no, like no other. His purpose was like no other that he has you and I in mind on this road to Jerusalem. He truly is a king like no other. And as he enters into the city, we see that his welcome is mixed. It's a mixed bag. That he is not equally received in the same manner. That there would have been uh, pockets of those who responded to Christ coming very differently from others. Look at what it says in the next three verses, uh, 37, 38, and 39. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples, his disciples, began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. These are his disciples, mind you. Second group, verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And for the Pharisees to say this to Jesus would have undoubtedly been also a statement of a rebuke against him himself. So we see on the one hand, the multitude of Jesus' disciples, his followers, he's coming into the city, they're praising him, they're glorifying him, and the <laughs> perpetual wet blanket of the story, the Pharisees, enter the scene. And I just wonder how that would have happened. I don't know, it, it doesn't say. I don't know if that was, they quietly pulled Jesus aside amidst this welcome and his disciples praising him, and they said, hey, 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 you need to shut this down. You need to... You need to rebuke your disciples. I don't know if it was an awkward in the moment they you know, got in front of his way and, and you could feel the tension. Rebuke your disciples. Either way, we see that Jesus catches the eye of both his disciples and the Pharisees. His welcome is mixed. And don't miss what his disciples are claiming of Jesus. Don't miss what identity they are reflecting back who Christ truly is. When they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they are uh, referencing Psalm 118, verse 26, which says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now, Psalm 118, 26, this is a royal psalm. This is a psalm that worship leaders of the Old Testament would have pulled out when it was time to, to have the coronation ceremony for the king. This psalm was reserved for kings. And here are the disciples not merely saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but they're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That wouldn't have been missed. His disciples say it. His disciples claim it. And it's so clear that the Pharisees, Jesus' enemies are mad because they hear what they're saying too. They're saying that Jesus is king. They're also calling Jesus Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who represents God, who is God. Remember, this is the Jesus that just forecasted exactly to brutal detail how this donkey would be acquired. This is no ordinary teacher. This is no ordinary rabbi. This is not an inspirational figure on the pages of history. This is God come for us. So if you call him king, 
and you call him Lord, and then you start to worship him, and he doesn't stop you, he just receives it, don't miss the incredible claim of the identity of who Jesus is. And if both his followers and his enemies pick up on this claim of, cle- uh, of who Jesus is, we can be sure that the Bible, the Bible leaves us no option for kind of a middle ground stance on Christ. You can't go halfway. You can't kind of maybe a sort of like Jesus. You're either all in or you're against him. He is king. And that means that all humanity has a decision to make. How do I respond to him then? Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will bow. Whether we bow willingly or whether we bow begrudgingly, that ball is in our court. And the Pharisees hear the claims that are being made of Jesus. They pull him aside and they rebuke him. They rebuke the Messiah that they had been waiting for. He's here. He's right in front of them. And I think this provides for you and I an implication uh, that I think is somewhat tangential, but I think is important for us to realize and, and recognize and be encouraged by, I hope, that when Christ comes into the life of people, the response is a mixed bag. Some people receive him. Some bow the knee. Some worship. Some give their lives to him. But some reject him. Some dig their heels. Some push back. Some rebuke. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember, to not be surprised by that. So when you and bring and usher Jesus into the proverbial cities of your conversations and your relationships and your circles, do not be surprised when you receive both responses. Some will receive him. Some will worship and bow their knee and come to him. But some will reject. And do not let the uncertainty and the unknown of how other people may or may not respond to Jesus Do not let that keep you from sharing Jesus. Don't let that keep you from making Jesus a topic of conversation. Don't let that keep you uh, from bringing Jesus into the circles of your relationships and conversations. Because on the one hand, we see when the Pharisees reject him, we get a little bit of an indicator of a human heart that rejects Christ. So we know it's coming. We know it's coming. It helps soften the blow a little bit if we know it's coming. But friends, we also see those who follow him, who receive him, who adore him, who worship him. Let that give you a sense of of excitement. Let that give you a, a sense of wonder. Let that give you a sense of when you say in your mind, there's no way this or that person could ever come to Christ. You might say, you don't know my brother. You don't know my mom or my dad. You don't know my uncle. You don't know my coworkers. They're never gonna bow the knee to Christ. Don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. Don't let the uncertainty of how people might respond to Jesus keep you from sharing him. Because when Jesus ushers in to a city, when Jesus ushers into a relationship, when Jesus ushers in to your relationships and conversations of people in your circles, yes, some will reject him. And our hearts break for that. We, we mourn over that. The passage that follows this passage is a glimpse of Jesus coming to this city and weeping over the city, weeping over the people that that are rejecting us. They don't even know what's happening. They don't even realize it's the coming of their Messiah and Christ breaks down. When God cries about something, we know that that hits deep into the heart of our Lord. So when we share Christ and people reject him, may our hearts break over that. May we shed tears over that. That's why we pray. That's why we, we, we seek to be faithful. That's why we cast ourselves on the work of the Holy Spirit that can only be a work of God in the life of people to draw men and women and boys and girls unto himself. Know that some will reject your Savior. Don't be surprised by that. But know that some will receive him. Know that some will come to know him. And it give, let that give you a sense of excitement and wonder. God might use you to move the ball a little bit further down the field toward a decision of faith. 
Sometimes, uh, sometimes your ministry into those around you, your friends who do not yet know Jesus, sometimes it might just be moving the ball one yard down the field. Sometimes God might give you the opportunity to, to see that ball cross the touchdown line and see someone be transferred out of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's in God's hands. That's under his authority. May he use you to help advance the work of the gospel. And as he enters, we see that though our king's coming is like no other, though his welcome is mixed, we see very clearly that our king, our Christ, it's because he is like no other. No other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Who is a God like you, parting, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? Who is a God that is perfectly just and perfectly loving? Who is a God that would send his own son? Who is a God that would send himself to die for his enemies that we might be saved? There is no other God. There is no other king. There is none like him. There is none like our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at, look at the last verse. Look at what Jesus says. After verse 39, when the Pharisees say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Look how Jesus answers. Verse 40, I tell you, Jesus says to the Pharisees, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. What a, what a statement, what an answer. How would you receive something like that? Can you imagine that? Again, I don't know if the Pharisees pulled him off to the side. I don't know if the Pharisees stood square in front of him and stopped the donkey and stopped him. Rebuke your disciples. He looks to them and says, if you stay silent, the stones will take over. See what Jesus is saying, that all creation worships God whether we join creation or not. There is no other God like our King. There is no other person like our Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior. Creation declares the glory of God. The skies declare His handiwork. Day and night they pour out speech of, they, they bear testimony to their Creator. I wonder if it filled those first listeners' ears with, with a remembrance of the words that Isaiah said in Isaiah 44, 23. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Maybe they thought about verses like Isaiah chapter 55, verse 12, that says, <laughs> For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. All the way through the Bible, we get this indicator that creation itself glorifies its creator. Along comes Jesus and says, the stones will worship me if you stay silent. See what he's claiming. That Lake Michigan and the dirt under this building and the clouds in the sky and the trees by the road glorify God by reflecting their artist. They glorify God by reflecting their creator. And we have the opportunity, we have the opportunity and privilege to join with all creation, whether in heaven or on earth, in the worship and the adoration of our King, who is like our God. There is no one like Him. His coming is like no other because He is like no other. And the welcome that he never really received was the true welcome that he really deserved. And his intention, though confused, why are you coming in peace? Why are you coming on this donkey? Do you see he's, he's going to undo the ultimate uh, evil underneath our evils, the enemy underneath our enemies? Sin and evil and brokenness and death would be undone in him, and he does it by his own undoing. He does it by his own death. He absorbs up sin into, uh, in and of himself. He became sin who knew no sin so that he could nail it to the cross and disarm all rulers and authorities, triumphing over them, putting them in open shame. And he would bury death in the grave itself. And then right behind Good Friday, we see Easter. 
that beautiful moment when he breaks forth in glorious day and all death and evil has been destroyed and undone. That's coming a week from now. Here we just see glimpses of it. Here we just see glimmers of this road that he's going to Jerusalem. Our king is like no other. And we see this passage showing us and telling us and proclaiming to us that the king of glory has come humbly for peace. Our king of glory, our God of glory, Jesus Christ, he is coming humbly for peace. Peace in heaven, peace for us, peace made possible by himself. And we see the events of this road to the cross taking place here. But in Colossians, we see the significance of the cross, that Jesus came to, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. How? Making peace by the blood of his cross. See what is happening in this entry. See how far God, Jesus Christ, is going to make peace with us. Because of Christ, God has the capacity to make peace with humanity. The message of biblical Christianity, the message of Scripture, is not that we humans are kind of neutral toward God. It's not that we enter this world and kind of, well, maybe I want to be for him, maybe I want to be against him. The message of biblical Christianity is we start out this journey dead. We start out this journey hostile against God. The heart of our first parents, Adam and Eve, is our heart. We turn our backs to him. We take a grasp at his throne. By default, we are enemies of God. We've broken his law. We've sinned against him. We've rebelled against him. And for God, for peace to even be made possible, God's got to do something about sin. God's got to do something about evil and brokenness. So he sends himself. He sends Jesus so that peace may be made possible with us because God is both just and loving. Any good judge can't just close their eyes to wrongdoing. Something has, it has to be paid for. Jesus says, I'll pay it out of my account. I'll take the bill. Send the tab to me. And Christ comes, and that is, our, that is the way that peace is possible. But we gotta respond to it, don't we? And the only way that we can have peace with God is by casting all of ourselves, all of our heart and soul on his grace and his mercy that we would die to our own self-salvation efforts, that we're no longer trying to earn his approval, we're no longer trying to work our way to him. The only way that we can be reconciled to God is taking refuge under the blood of the Lamb. It's by being united to Christ by faith in him, that he himself is our salvation. He himself is our peace. He is the reconciler between God and man, and he does it by his own death. He does it by his own undoing. Our king of glory is coming humbly for peace, to make peace, to be peace. And primarily, we have peace with God on this vertical plane. But friends, you know how the implications of the gospel work, don't you? That if we've got peace with God, then therefore, we can start to make peace with others. That if the core of the gospel is a savior who is willing to die for even his enemies out of self-sacrificial love to make peace with his enemies. He's praying for those who are, who are nailing him to the cross. He's holding peace and reconciliation out for them to hold and have. And if that's the core of the gospel, and if that's in your heart, and your heart, and your heart, and your heart, and in my heart, that makes peacemakers out of Christ's followers. Christians start to represent a, a counterculture Christians start to embody this, this whole different community of people. We start to reflect a different kingdom. We start to show that we're following a different king. And we start to become peacemakers. And if there is ever a moment in recent time where we don't have to convince anyone that the world is not doing a very good job at peacemaking, nobody's doing a good job at peacemaking. And our world is trying. Hear the broken cry, or hear the cry of a broken world behind the world's attempts to make peace. Have you noticed? The world tries to make peace either by through cancel culture. You offend me, I offend you. We cancel each other. We unfriend. We push back. And in an age of digital tribalism, we draw the lines. We shove each other back to our, to our given tribes around whatever that may be. And we, the world is trying to make peace by cancel culture. Just go over there. 
or the world tries to make peace by just out yelling their opponents. Whoever yells the loudest, whoever yells the longest, whoever can subdue their enemies just by the shouts of their hearts and mouths, they're trying to make peace. The world is trying to make peace. And friends, Christians, brothers and sisters, hear the cry of a, of a world broken. The human heart longs for peace. Our heart longs for paradise restored. And in and of ourselves, we're going to try all sorts of ways that don't quite get the job done. The gospel gets the job done. Do you see what the gospel offers? Do you see the implications of this? That if we have been made peace with God, we can turn even to our enemies. And instead of trying to outshout or outyell, instead of trying to cancel, we reconcile. We, we, we love, even in self-sacrifice, we die to live for others that we might see enemies of God become friends of God, children of God, and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Friends, the world needs what the gospel offers. The world needs the king that God has sent. And our king, our king, the king of glory has come in humility and meekness for peace. May that news be something too good not to share. May that truth be something too true in your life that it cannot help but transform you. May that be something as we usher, proverbially speaking, as we usher Jesus Christ into our circles and conversations and relationships, the world might see their king. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that we would be profoundly shaped not, not only by the fact that you came and that changes our lives, not only by the fact who you are and that changes our lives, but how you came for us, how you modeled best what it looks like to come in humility and self-sacrifice and service to others. Lord, put that heart in our hearts and may our heart breaks over the things that break your heart. Lord, may, as you cried over Jerusalem, longing that they might see you as their true Messiah, may our hearts cry and break over Gurney and Waukegan and Gages Lake and all the surrounding areas. May our hearts break for Lake County. May our hearts break for our family, our brothers and sisters, our parents, our grandparents, cousins, aunts and uncles. May our hearts break, Lord, for those who have yet to bow the knee, for those who have yet to receive you in saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So, Father, this work is too important. Go before us. May you do a mighty work in us for your name's sake that the world might welcome their king. Amen. We're about to sing this word over and over again, this word Hosanna. And it's important that we know what it is that we're singing on Sunday mornings. Um, so it, um, this past Tuesday, I actually took the, the worship team through this uh, article by John Piper. I encourage you to look it up. It's, just look up John Piper and Hosanna. It's a nice long read. Not too long. It's a couple minutes. I'm going to give you the shortened version. Essentially, the word Hosanna um, in the Old Testament is used one time, um, and it just meant help, save. Help, comma, save. Um, and the New Testament is used more, much more times, and uh, in that context, it, it came to mean salvation is on its way salvation is here so it became a word of of just this desperate cry it became this word of salvation is here it's it's a word of praise um, directed towards god and a story i think of when i think of this word is when i was a kid i was in a lake um, i couldn't swim yet the water i went a little too far in the water the water was over my head i couldn't breathe so i was kind of jumping out my head coming out over the water and I just remember saying, save me, save me. 
and uh, my head would go under. I'd jump up again, save me, save me. I was just looking for anybody to come save me. And at one point, I think that third time I jumped up, I saw my brother Stephen coming towards me. And so thinking that same thing saved me, but I'm also seeing my brother Stephen coming to save me. Salvation is here. And it was this exclamation of praise, Hosanna, salvation has come, salvation is here, it's on the way. So that's the word we're going to sing, Hosanna, please save, salvation is here, directed towards Jesus. Um, Let's stand um, and sing together.
Salvation is on its way, and it has come. Our King has come for you and I, and come to make peace. By way of our benediction, let me just read how heaven itself receives and honors the King who has come for us. Hear these words to send us out to our ministry, to our mission field. Hear these words to send us out to live under obedience and worship of our King. From Revelation chapter 5, it says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, tongue, language, and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all the living creatures and the elders fell down and worshiped. Amen and amen. God bless you as you go out.